Hello, hi, good, good afternoon. Um, welcome to China Exchange. My name is Louise. I am Program and Partnerships Manager here. Thank you so much for joining us for our China in Context Festival, celebrating writers and writing from and about China. China Exchange is an independent charity dedicated to bringing people into Chinatown for more than food and inspiring people to learn more about China and China's influence in the world. In today's event, we're celebrating the work of Jin Yong, the pen name of Hong Kong-based author Louis Cha. Jin Yong is the Chinese-speaking world's best-selling author, and estimated sales of his books are, including the bootleg copies, 300 million worldwide. His writing has made him a household name throughout East Asia, and his works have been adapted for TV and cinema countless times. However, Jin Yong's books are little known outside of East Asia. It has been said that his works are untranslatable, that they're too foreign for an English-speaking reader. Well, here in my hand, I hold a copy. I balance everything together. Here in my hand, I hold an English translation of Jin Yong's epic, The Legend of the Condor Heroes. Proof that it can be translated and that it can be done. Today, I am joined by Anna Holmwood, who translated the untranslatable, <laughs> and has brought one of the world's best love stories to an English-speaking audience for the first time. We're also joined by Dr. Lu Xiaoning, an expert on Chinese literature and cinema from the London School of Oriental and African Studies, and Sue Cole co-founder of the Fighting Spirit Film Festival. Before we start the discussion, I will invite the actor Hai Ching to the stage, who will treat us to a reading from Jin Yong's book. Before we begin, I would like to thank the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office for their generous support of this event. And their generous support of the Hong Kong focus at the China in Context Festival. I would also like to thank Asia House for partnering with us on this event and for Quirkus Books for bringing this wonderful book to an English-speaking audience. Before we meet Anna, Xiaoning and Su, please welcome actor Hai Ching to the stage. Thank you, Louise. <laughs> so... Um, it was um, during the third watch later that night. Sky Fury Guo and Ironheart Yang had been waiting for more than two hours to spear a boar or a munchak in the woods, seven li west of the village. But it was looking increasingly unlikely they would catch anything, and they were losing patience. At that moment, a loud smack of wood against metal echoed around the woodland from beyond the tree line. Sky Fury and Ironheart looked at each other. Then came the sound of men shouting, Where do you think you're going? Stop now! A shadow had entered the woods and was running in their direction. The moonlight caught a man's robe, and Guo and Yang were able to make him out. It was Chu San. He was jabbing his wooden crutches into the undergrowth. Knowing that he would struggle to outrun men who were following him, Chu San flew straight up into the air and back down behind a nearby tree. Guo and Yang looked at each other in astonishment. Chi San practices martial arts. By now, Chi San's pursuers had reached the edge of the woods. There were three of them, and they stopped, whispered something to each other, and began to walk towards Guo and Yang. They were dressed in military clothing, and each carried a saber, blades flashing a cold green in the moonlight. Damn cripple! We can see you! Come out and surrender! Chi San stood utterly still behind his tree. The men were waving their weapons like machetes, swinging and chopping through a straggly branch, slowly edging closer. Just then, thump! Chi San thrust his right crutch out from behind the tree, hitting one of the men squarely in the chest and sending him lurching backwards with a yelp. Startled, the other two men waved their blades in the direction of the tree. Using his right crutch for leverage, 
Chee San flew up to the left, dodging the flailing blades and thrusting his other crutch in the man's face. The man tried to block the crutch with his saber, but Chee San pulled back and swung his right crutch at the other man's stomach. Though he needed the crutches to support himself, he wielded them with speed and elegance. A saber cut into Chisan's bundle, ripping the cloth and spilling its contents all over the forest floor. Taking advantage of the distraction, Chisan smashed his crutch down onto one man's head, knocking him on the ground. Terrified, the last soldier turned to run. Chisan reached between the folds in his robe and with a sharp flick of his wrist, hurled something at him as he fled. It glinted an inky black as it sails through the air, drawing a curve and landing on the back of the soldier's head with a dull thud. The man howled and dropped his saber, his arms waving wildly. He fell forward as if in slow motion and landed in the crumpled heap on the ground. His body spasmed twice. And then, he was still. Guo and Yang watched, their hearts thumping, hardly able to catch their breath. <laughs> he just killed common officials, just punishable by death, Guo gasped. If, if he sees us, he'll kill us too, to keep us quiet. But they're not hidden themselves as well as they had thought. Chi Sen turned towards them and called out, Master Kuo, Master Yang, you can come out now. Reluctantly, they rose to their feet, grasping their pitchforks so tightly, their knuckles turned white. Yang looked at his friend and then took two steps forward. Master Yang, Chi Sen said with a smile, your family's spear technique is famous throughout our land, but in the absence of a spear, a pitchfork will have to do. Your best friend, Guo, however, prefers to fight with a double halberd. The pitchfork doesn't fit his skills. Such friendship is rare. Yang felt exposed. Chi San had all but read his mind. Master Guo, Chi San continued, let's imagine you had your double halberd with you. Do you think together you could beat me? Guo shook his head. Uh, no, we couldn't. Uh, uh, we must have been blind not to have noticed you. You're a fellow practitioner of martial arts, a master even. I don't have full use of my legs. How can I be considered a master? Chi Sen shook his head and sighed. Before my injury, I would have defeated those guards if effortlessly. Guo and Yang glanced at each other, not sure how to respond. Will you help me bury them? Chi San continued. They looked at each other again and nodded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hai Ching, for reading to us from The Legend of the Condor Heroes. Now, please welcome to the stage Anna. Xiao Ning and Su. There we are, we're all on. So I'm going to start this discussion by asking Xiao Ning a few questions about um, Jin Yong. For the people who in the audience who may not be familiar with Jin Yong's work, maybe you haven't even ever heard of him before, and Xiao Ning, if you could just give us some background on Jin Yong and why he's such a household name in East Asia. Um, why, why is Jin Yong's influence so important? Okay, um, I guess a lot of our audience are are here because you wanted to see Jung Jin Yong. But let me tell you, uh, Jin Yong, he was born in 1924. So this year, he is 94 years old. Uh, so 
Jin Yong is the pen name of uh, Zha Liang Yong, or English name is Louis Cha. Zha Liang Yong, he was born in the city of Hainan, Zhejiang province in China. Um, this family is a really established, really established literary family in, in the city of Hainan. So if uh, many of you may have heard of such important and um, famous Chinese poets such as Xu Zhimo and Mu Dan. Mu Dan's real name is Zha Liang Zhen. They are all cousins. Okay, so it's a very famous uh, established family. And um, Jin Yong was born in in mainland China, this is very important. He grew up there. In 1948, he relocated to Hong Kong. Uh, as we know, in 1949, Communist Party took over China. So around 1948, many people were forced uh, to, to relocate either to Taiwan or Hong Kong. So this is a very influential uh, element in, for his writing career as well. <coughs> so. Um, Jin Yong actually is not just a very famous Chinese writer. He is a very established publisher and entrepreneur. Uh, he founded this uh, very famous Ming Bao in Hong Kong, a newspaper, widely circulated newspaper. He is also a he also served as a member of Hong Kong Basic Law Drafting Committee in 1985. Uh, so you will see his very influential figure uh, in Chinese uh, society, not only in Hong Kong. Um, okay, then I just want to talk a little bit about why he started to write a uh, martial arts novel. Uh, Jin Yong has been hailed as one of the pioneer or vanguard of the new school martial arts fiction. Um, because he started to write in around the mid of the 1950s in Hong Kong. Uh, this was called so-called new school because the old school, basically, most people wrote martial arts in mainland China. So there's a geographical, geopolitical difference there. Uh, in the 1950s, Jin Yong worked as a journalist. So the flourishing of the martial arts fiction had a lot to do with the print culture. Um, you know, the newspaper, as a very fundamental feature of Chinese newspaper, is they, each newspaper has a literary supplement. In order to attract more readers, uh, newspaper publish serialized stories or fictions. So which paper published most exciting story, uh, that paper, would be more likely to attract more readers. So around 1954, um, a very really interesting anecdote in Hong Kong, two schools of martial arts, uh, two masters from two schools of martial arts, they competed, they staged a fight in a park in Macau. And so that excited a lot of interest among the Hong Kong and the local uh, Hong Kong residents and the Macau residents. Just within a few days, Liang Yushen, another writer, he started to write, serialize his martial arts fiction, Tiger and uh, uh, Long Ho, Dragon and a Tiger Vile in Capital. Okay? So Long Hu Dong, Dou Jinghua, this is the first one, new school martial arts fiction. And he serialized the fiction in Xin Wan Bao, a newspaper. Uh, it's instant success. Okay. And that novel invited so many imitators. And to capitalize on the success of the, the first martial arts fiction, and the editor of the newspaper asked Liang Yushen to recommend people who can also write martial arts novel. Uh, therefore, Liang Yushen recommended Jin Yong. Okay. Jin Yong started to write uh, a year later, 1955. His first book is Sword and the pay, uh, Shu Jian and Chou Lu, Shu, so it's a book and a sword, uh, gratitude and revenge, uh, instant success as well. In 19, around 1959, if I remember correctly, or seven, uh, he started to write um, the Condor Hero that really established his reputation uh, in the literary field. Uh, thereafter, I think he spent about 17 years writing martial arts fiction. Um, vivid characters, most of the stories set in um, imperial China. So there you can see a lot of um, kind of a nostalgic. As a refugee, 
your, the post-war immigrants in Hong Kong, their nostalgia for the homeland can be manifested in their longing for the Chinese culture, traditional culture. So many of his stories are set in dynastic China and reflect upon the Chinese-ness, uh, maybe the decline of the Chinese empire or uh, etc. Uh, especially all those elements are most manifested in this book, The Condor Hero. Okay, I think I roughly finish here. <laughs> um, why do you think... <laughs> Thank you for that very comprehensive history, Xiaoning. And why do you think um, these books resonate and are so popular today still? Um, I think at the very beginning, he really focused on constructing heroes. Toward the end of his novel, uh, the writing career of the martial arts novel, he focused more on humanity. The very last hero, um, hero protagonist in his last novel has no martial arts skill at all. Yet, the person is able to use his wit, use all kinds of intrigue to defeat all the opponents. So, his novel not only presents uh, a picture of Chinese culture, but also really delve into the humanity. Okay. Thank you. And Anna, we can all see that you're a young translator and no one has been entrusted with translating these works before. Can you tell us a bit about the story behind how you started to translate Jin Yong's work and um, what does that level of pressure feel like? Yes, uh, <clears throat> it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yes, um, so I first started translating Jin Yong when I was 26, I think, and uh, it's five years later, uh, or maybe 27, um, and I think that it, there is a, some part of this is the kind of uh, folly of youth that I, <laughs> that I said that I could do this. Uh, I think that by going into, um, you know, really undertaking the work, um, I realized a bit more deeply why, it, why it's been considered so difficult to translate Jin Yong. Um, uh, it has been a, a challenge and it's been, a, I've definitely feel I've grown a lot as a translator through the process. Um, to give the kind of story behind how it happened, um, I was contacted by a British agent, Peter Buckman, who is sitting um, over there, um, who was interested in um, working with Chinese literature through a personal connection of his. Um, and he sort of suggested he'd heard of Jin Yong and he suggested him and I, we had a discussion um, about it. and. Um, I said, oh, let me, you know, go away and read a bit, and um, and I came back and I said, oh, I think this is a really great idea. I think there's um, there's a really, you know, there's something about his writing that I think can is universal and can be translated, even though uh, so few of his books have been translated. There, there's there's been a few translations before by university publishers, uh, university presses, but not by a trade publisher before in English. Um, so we kind of embarked on, on this process together to find a way to describe Jin's work and also for me to make a sample and um, uh, he gave me lots of feedback on what he thought, you know, how to improve it. Um, so through this kind of joint effort, um, and then he, he was recommending it to publishers. There was a, a lot of interest um, before Christopher McLehose, who is also sitting over here, um, does, uh, said that he wanted to publish it. So it was a kind of um, this process, the initial build up and the, the kind of learning how to present Jin Yong to publishers. Um, that was a kind of collaborative process where we, we just talked and, and kind of looked at how to uh, frame and how to best uh, present that, uh, present Jin Yong's work um, because obviously he's such a huge household name in, in China and Asia, in East Asia in general, um, but has so little name recognition um, among the kind of general public in English. So um, it was really fun to be able to kind of be part of that discussion behind the scenes and see the um, agent do his magic to, um, to be able to sell it, yeah. And what did you learn to appreciate about the stories through the translation process? Um, so obviously, uh, when you're translating something, you're really like the closest, closest reader. So you really are grappling with every sentence in the story. And um, But one of the things that I found was most exciting was how 
even though I was really delving into all of these details and it was, you know, it's, translation is quite a slow process, I was still being caught up in the story. I was still finding it exciting. I still was returning the page and wanting to keep translating. And I think it's that quality of Jinyon's writing that I hope that I've managed to um, convey in the English because that really is the essence of Jin Yong's skill is that he can take these big, this big setting, um, there's uh, lots of characters um, and to weave it into this, um, into this story that you almost don't notice that you're reading. I mean, you're just flipping through the pages, kind of caught up in, in the action and uh, the poetry of his world. Um, so that was both the most difficult part of it to transfer into English, but the thing that was the most pleasurable as a translator, that you, um, sort of sitting down every day, it was kind of part of entering into this, this world that um, Jin Yong has created. Have you met Jin Yong? Unfortunately, no. Um, I, uh, we have tried. <laughs> like we've, uh, we've all been trying, but um, um, I think that he is not uh, receiving visitors. <laughs> um, he's not really receiving um, visitors at the moment, so um, unfortunately, I haven't had the pleasure in person. But I, I did get, we did get to go to his um, amazing offices with a panoramic view of Hong Kong, and I, I, I think at that moment I thought, oh no, what have I, um, what have I said yes to? I'm not sure if I, if I, um, I'm, I can take this on my shoulders. But um, yes, I've tried my best, try to push away the um, pressure sometimes, otherwise I think it becomes a bit much in the, d in the day to day of actually doing the translation. Um, I had to kind of push it out of my mind that, th that Jin Yong has so many beloved fans, that he is such a sort of ha national treasure um, in China. Yeah. Do you feel that like you learned more about him as a man through doing the translation? Yeah, yeah, I, um, that's an interesting question. I haven't been asked that one before. Um, I think uh, I could feel, uh, I think I, I felt like I was entering into, uh, part of it was the context in which they were written. So because obviously 1950s Hong Kong um, is, a, is a sort of, there's particular, a lot's changed in China, the politics of China, politics of the relationship with Hong Kong, everything has changed. So in a way, it was quite fascinating to enter into a story that is almost itself a histor, I mean, it's a piece of history. Um, and to see what the, to really understand how this, the worldview that he's building up in these stories, how it related to the time in which the books were written. Um, and to also, really get to the core of, when you get to the core of Jin Yong's stories, although the context, the history, everything is, is very Chinese, at its very center, you find that these, are, these characters actually are motivated by the same kinds of things as you and I in the modern day. And that I find was really powerful um, experience as well to realize that actually, um, if you kind of take away some of the obvious things that make it culturally different, when you get down to how the stories really work, they have a lot of connections to a Western literary tradition. There's a lot about this idea of the hero, com making the hero a complex notion. You know, it's not just black and white. Jin Yong doesn't write black and white characters. His characters are very nuanced. They have, um, they both, they, people can be motivated by good and wanting to do good, but also be a um, bit, you know, caught up in their own egos or like be, be going into fights because, you know, also their pride and things like that. He, he, he puts a lot of things into his characters that I think we um, can fundamentally understand, even if we don't aren't so familiar with the historical context or even indeed the time in which he was writing. And uh, for someone who's not read his books, why would you recommend that they read them? They're fun. <laughs> That's the main thing. I mean, I, I really want to emphasize this. It's not like, a, you know, it's, it's not about getting to know China, or doing your homework. It's just, you know, the pleasure of being able to just sit down and be enter into a story um, and characters and things. I think that's... that's Jin Yong, the heart of Jin Yong's writing is to be fun. And um, that's the way they should be read as well, I think. Uh, Xiaoling, could you tell us how, how based in history are... Jin Yong stories. How, how based in history are they? Because um, they're set in a historical time period. Um, do you, are they very historical? Are they based around real events or is it mostly fiction? 
mostly, uh, I would say, mostly fiction, but he loosely take a few historical figures, right? And the stories would be based on those historical figures, but give the spin. Uh, for, its, for example, the first, very first fiction, Shu Jian En Chou Lu, uh, Sword and uh, Book and Sword, um, that book is based on the identity of Qianlong Empire, uh, Emperor. So the, um, the basic idea is Qianlong Emperor could be not a Manju, but he was, it's because the, uh, some people swapped the babies. So the Emperor could be a Han. Okay, so you see a lot of interesting incidents from, from history. Uh, even in the Condor Hero, what, what this book touch, touches me a lot is about um, its character's toys between um, their own Chinese dynasty and uh, their personal feeling maybe toward another empire. Uh, for instance, the, one of the key protagonists, Guo Jing, um, I don't know how did you translate his name, Guo Jing, okay. Um, so he was brought up by the Mongols. He grew up there in the Mongol, in Mongolian grassland. And he was even chosen as the princess, the princess's future husband. But nevertheless, uh, facing the decline of the Chinese Song, um, uh, Song Dynasty, Song Empire, he felt he is obliged, he's, he has this duty and the obligation to fight for the Chinese, uh, the, uh, the Chinese part. So then from all those personal struggles and choices, you will see the spirit of the chivalry. And that's the key to the martial arts fiction. The martial arts fiction in Chinese is Wu Xia. Wu is martial arts. Xia, this one usually has not been translated. It's, it's very hard. There's no correspondence in English. Uh, so it literally means, uh, we can loosely translate as the spirit of chivalry. But it means the codes of honor, your royalty, your faith, etc. A lot of uh, traditional moral, moral systems. Sue, so you're very familiar with this chivalry and um, it comes from martial arts um, fiction. Um, you co-founded a martial arts film festival. Can you tell us more about how Jin Yong's work has inspired the films and the TV shows that you love? Well, that's a really big question. Um, I suppose from my personal point of view, um, I got really interested in martial arts from watching films and um, some of them, I'm sure a lot of people here have watched them anyway, but Things like Kung Fu Hustle, I watched that last night, for example, and from reading the book, you can see the characters. Stephen Chow was clearly influenced by some of them. These characters, they, they look like ordinary people, and then when you see them on the screen, you underestimate them, and it <coughs> turns out they're martial art masters, and they do have this like code of honor that they kind of, there's an understanding where they kind of, you know, when they face up to each other, they kind of have a respect. They clearly know when someone is bettering them or not bettering them. And there's a discipline because they all know that they didn't wake up one morning and have these skills. They've had to work hard for them. So um, it's really inspiring. I'm actually really glad you've written the book, actually, because um, um, Chinese writing is not something I'm really easy to read. Um, I was brought up in the West and my parents are English. Um, so to be able to read this book is really interesting for me. Um, I realized that I've watched a lot of films and I didn't know that they were influenced by this, this guy. So, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And his works have been interpreted for the screen many times. If you were to recommend an adaptation, which one would it be? Oh, I guess, um, I, 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 cause I watched Kung Fu Hustle last night, I'd recommend that, although it's not a direct one really. Um, I suppose I've been thinking, I haven't seen a lot of the old ones and I'm not very good with names, I'm gonna be honest, but um, I like the films like Hero from Jiang Yimou, which has that kind of wuxia culture and um, I think, um, this, this, yeah, <laughs> sorry. May I yes, um, yeah. Yeah, so I just have to mention, uh, I, I, I'm off from, from mainland China. Um, we got a chance to know Jing Yong only in the middle of the 1980s, although he started to write his books in 1950s. And there was a big smash hit television drama series based on Jing Yong's, it's this book. It's the Condor Hero, that's my favorite. 1983 TVB version, okay? That's the classic. There were many different versions, uh, television series, but that's my classic, this is the classic. I still recommend. Uh, 
Sue, can I ask you, if, um, do you, would you like to see a English language um, adaptation come out of um, this new translation into English? Um, I've, I've read a lot of comic books and I've read this book and The Legendary Couple was one of the comic books I've read and I think um, going in line with what martial arts is about and the different characters, I think it's really interesting to see these characters where if you see someone and you don't know that they can do martial arts and suddenly have this amazing skill, I find it really inspiring because it, it lets people know that through a bit of hard work and perseverance you can achieve something and I think the stories that he's written show that and it's really interesting like you've got people with diversity in the book so some of them are really old some of them are blind some of them have got maybe they've got a stick and they're called crippled but then they have these amazing martial arts skills and you just wouldn't expect that and there's even a character that changes gender and that's quite remarkable really for like in this day and age when they talk about lack of diversity in a lot of films in this book there's so much diversity with them covering like you know age disability and gender issues which i think is really interesting so i would think it'd be great yeah and how there's lots of different um, martial arts moves that are named in the book how many of them are at, you could could you actually replicate in real life <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't think a lot of them some of them are a lot of poetic license but that's no different to watching a marvel film these days and um i think People can be inspired by all kinds of things, really, and our imagination is one of the best things we have. Um, I think the story is great, and that shouldn't take any away from the martial arts. Also, they are very clever. They use strategy, and that part you can't. Anyone can do that. It just takes a bit of time. They say martial arts is a bit like chess. You have to kind of imagine the moves um, of your opponent beforehand. So. I would say do not imitate, do not copy. Um, <laughs> in this book, home. there is a character, Silicon May. The specific martial arts she practice, she has to use the human skeleton. <laughs> don't, don't practice that. And um, one, one for all of you. So do you, you have a favorite character? Well, I always, um, I actually like the, the Seven Freaks of the South, as they're called, the Jiang Nan Qi Guai. Um, I like them as a band. You see, I, I like the way that they interact with each other. They're this, um, they call themselves a martial family. Of course, they're not related. But they, um, they've all got their kind of, uh, each character has their own sort of uh, slightly eccentric uh, aspect. Um, and together, they kind of form this band that are fundamentally good, but also very uh, driven by their egos, um, which I also think is really funny as well. They're very um, uh, kind of comic comic band. So they kind of get tricked, uh, without doing any spoilers alert, but they kind of get tricked into, um, through their own uh, egos, get tricked into a situation where they have to spend a very long time <laughs> trying to, on a, on a martial contest. Um, and I just think it's, it's pretty funny to, to be able to uh, let your ego lead you down a many years uh, mission. Um, so they're my favorites, I think. Do you have one, Sue? I don't really have one. I'm really biased. So um, I always like backing the underdog. I like people that have a hard journey and somehow overcome it. And then anyone that does martial arts. So it's biased there. So that's mine. Favorite character? No, I have so many. I like so many of them. <laughs> and another one for all of you. So. Um, how has Jin Yong inspired you, and what do you think the translation will bring for new audiences? Um, well, I hope that um, Jin Yong did the, by translating Jin Yong's work uh, into English that he will reach reach kind of new readers who don't really know much about China martial arts, all of these things. That um, I mean, I think sometimes. Uh, people can hear oh, martial arts and think, oh, that's just for people who like martial arts. But, I mean, really, the martial arts aspect of it um, is just one, one part. Um, really, it's the story and the kind of characters and their emotional lives and stuff that really make the book sing. And so um, I hope that, um, you know, there'll be some... 10-year-olds who've never thought of reading something like this, uh, maybe don't really read in books in translation, who might pick this up and um, discover a kind of new world of characters. I think um, we talk a lot about uh, the importance of diversity of stories at the moment. That's very, you know, it's a buzzword, but it shouldn't just be a buzzword. It's actually, you know, when there are, there are books, fantastic books being published, and um, it's just about sort of getting them out to readers and letting readers know 
there, there are a lot of diverse studies, like uh, diverse stories are being published, and I just hope that, you know, um, we, Jingrong can reach sort of new young people, um, new young readers, like he inspires every year in China, all these young people who still read him. Yeah, you can find that in, in English as well. Uh, how, how, so how do you think the translation will um, inspire new audiences and what do you think it will do? Uh, it's up to our readers. Mm -hmm. I can only say uh, how it influenced me. Jing Yong is always, uh, for me, it's always associated with my teenager years because I was an avid reader of Jing Yong when I was 10 years old up to 15 years old. And I really appreciate the literary quality of his writing because he quoted so, he used a lot of, um, first of all, he, he followed the traditional Chinese uh, fiction, the linked chapter format. So, and then he also used a lot of classical poems. He wrote many classical poems. And he sprinkled so many historical events, incidents, characters that really aroused my interest in Chinese history. Okay. Um, again, from my point of view, I, I love martial arts, I love movies, and I wish there was more writing that I could read about it. It's one way that I learn about the culture, but it also feeds my interest in martial arts. Um, I like how people are motivated. I also like that the characters, you've got um, strong female characters as well, and as a female doing martial arts, um, I'd love more role models. I like Jackie Chan, I like Jet Li, but there's not many female role models. And maybe some people might read the books and it might open the doors for more people to kind of write books themselves, maybe inspire them to write about the subject, might give filmmakers inspiration for their stories and make films, and then maybe we can get to see them on the big screen and that would be amazing. Just before we open um, the Q&A up to the audience, um, Anna, can you tell us, this is the first of many um, works are we going to see the rest of Jin Yong's work translated into English? I'm going to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, my co-translator is sitting in the audience. Gigi is um, waving over there. She's um, just finished uh, book two. Wow. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, she, I'm giving you a round of applause. You finished <laughs> book two. Um, <laughs> So we've been, um, we, we, uh, you d really don't want to see our sort of like a chat history because we're talking to each other every day about, ran you know, words and, you know, how to translate this, what is this character's name going to be? So, um, yes, we're in almost daily contact, even though she's in Shanghai and I'm in Sweden. Um, so uh, then I'm starting book three. Um, and then I think Gigi will get book four. You have to start again soon, I'm sorry. <laughs> You don't get much break. You've got you to keep going. Um, so we're, get, we're, you know, at the moment, we're, we're a sort of two-person team, I guess. It makes it nice, actually, to have somebody else um, to sort of bat these ideas against because uh, on my own, I, at the beginning, I was feeling as a, quite a weight to kind of come up with, you know, take all of this on myself. So um, Gigi's been fantastic um, to be able to kind of bounce ideas off and, and um, sometimes we have some very zany brainstorming sessions that result in some pretty crazy suggestions for, for translations for things um, and then through that we managed to kind of find our way um, onto something so um, yes we're, we're, we're going to we're going to keep going yes <laughs> yeah. I could ask my colleague Ying to come and grab the microphone um, and then does anybody have a question that they would like to ask this gentleman at the front Okay. Uh, first, I'll say I'm very happy to be here to meet Anna because I'm uh, currently doing a PhD project of translating martial arts literature into English. So, Jin Yun translations is a key part of my project. And uh, so, I may be asking some questions related to academic, but also interesting. Uh, when you translate Jin Yun, uh, what, is the dif what are the difficulties you have faced and uh, in order to produce produce this kind of perfect version, how, I mean, what kind of strategies or how to deal with this kind of difficulties? Thank you. Um, thank you for your question. I'm very excited that you are doing uh, research on this. I, um, I hope there'll be lots of more martial arts fiction that you'll be able to, to look at as well, not just um, Jin Yong. 
Um, I hope this sparks more interest in translating martial arts fiction into English or into other um, languages, indeed. Um, so I would say that, uh, of course, no translation is perfect. It's a kind of like, you know, it's a, always a um, compromise. Compromise sounds a bit um, negative, but the, there's always going to be um, certain compromises and things that you have to do in order to try and bridge such um, two different languages, um, uh, culturally and also just grammatically, all of these things. Um, I think one of the most difficult things is um, in the fight scenes. Um, There's obviously a very key component to martial arts fiction, and um, the fight scene itself is a kind of, I would say, an a particular aesthetic. It's influenced a lot also from from in film. You know, if you think in film, you have like the speeding up and the slowing down, and all of these kinds of techniques that are used. Um, when martial arts fiction is, um, or when martial arts stories are filmed. Um, and I think that one thing that I found challenging was how to make sure that when uh, translating the, the fights into English that they maintain the pace and the excitement of the original. Um, Chinese verbs are very kind of short and they can be very easily, you know, pun you know they're punching and kicking and it can be, it will read very fast. And it's very important, I felt, to make sure that the pacing of the fight scenes were equally as exciting and that I didn't get bogged down in maybe some of the, like, slowing down the, these parts. So that was the one of the most kind of difficult uh, aspects, but also the most fun. I think that made me really see that um, the translation process wasn't just to make sure that I got all of the facts and details correct, but actually that the spirits of the fiction came through, that the excitement and the pace um, were recreated into English. Um, yeah. Hello. Uh, I'm 70. I was born and bred in Hong Kong. So I actually grew up in the era when his books first came onto the market. Um, if I remember correctly, there's one the main thing is the undertone of the, the book. It's about the Hans of trying to overturn the Qings because they were invaded China. And as young people, we all have this win. That, that is what drove us on. And the way he wrote the, the martial art movements was in such a way, it's so detailed, you can visualize that how it happened. He said he aimed a kick at somebody's pressure point. You can actually try it and you can visualize <laughs> it. But seriously, and his book didn't come out in one book. It came out in sequel, and that keeps you going. And also, I, he didn't write one book at a time. He wrote many books, yeah. and somehow he can manage to keep the story going with different storylines. I think that's marvelous. To us, uh, Jing Yong was the hero, not the hero in the book. This is a question for Anna, but I was just wondering, um, has working on this project made you think that you'd like to write any work of your own or do your own novel, or do you prefer breathing life into someone else's work? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm embarrassed to say I probably do have some uh, sort of literary ambitions, <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's just as well that uh, I'm not, at the moment, haven't... Uh, launch them on the world yet um, but there is something I think that it's not probably unco it's not uncommon amongst literary translators that um, for me I have always loved writing ever since I was a child reading and writing and um, and I've loved languages I grew up as bilingual although not with Chinese unfortunately but um, uh, so learning languages has always been a passion of mine and so um, literary translation has been this amazing um, amazing career, I'm going to say career, um, although I it feels strange to say that, but amazing vocation or calling or craft, uh, because it brings together those two sort of interests for me. Um, so, but there is something quite special about doing literary translation, the fact that you get to put aside your, it's not, you know, it's not about me, it's about Jin Yong. So I get to say this is, these are, this, doing this work is not about my own um, ego or fame or anything, it's got nothing to do with me. Uh, the, best op the best outcome is that everyone kind of forgets about me and that everyone sees Jin Yong. And that's when I know, that, well, that's the kind of, when you know you've been successful as a translator. So in a way it's a very, 
um, it's, it's a very interesting way to explore a passion for writing when you put yourself kind of at the, the back of the list and you, you think you're focusing on the, um, on the writer and their words and their, their creative imagination. Just to say thank you, Anna, and I guess your agent and publisher too. This, it's really exciting to have this sort of stuff on the shelf and, and so different to everything else that, that's normally available to do with Chinese literature. I just wonder if you could talk a bit about names. Uh, what I've tried to get my friends and family excited and in, interested in Chinese literature, they always trip over their names. They're either transliterated, and that is quite hard to distinguish and loses a lot of meaning, or they're translated at, literally and at, you know, they get very exoticized. You seem to have done a half and half. Could you talk about your approach? <clears throat> so this is probably the controversial <laughs> aspect of um, my translation, so the naming. Um, yes, yeah, so I know it's kind of arises a lot of um, opinions on both sides. And um, as you've laid it out, it's basically, it's like there's two poles. There's the, you, you use the transliteration, you use opinion, um, in which case all of that richness, all of that, uh, you know, culture and everything about the character is, is, to be honest, is completely lost because we have no connection to uh, opinion names. It doesn't tell us anything. And then there's translating into English, and then that obviously it, um, some people feel that that um, can be Orientalist or exoticizing unnecessarily. Um, I had a lot of, you know, all through the whole process, this was a really big question for me. Um, but I felt that. Just doing pinyin, I would have lost a lot. So I, I kind of, um, I have a sort of <clears throat> thing that I say, which is imagine if you took, you know, I don't know, Lord of the Rings or any of your favorite books in English, and you replaced all of the character names with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you just did that randomly, and then you said, here's the character name. You would feel like you had lost an incredible amount of that novel. You would, you know, all of the information that we contain within names. I think sometimes... Um, in this discussion about how do you deal with Chinese n naming and um, how do you translate it, um, people get very kind of fixated on the idea that, well, Chinese names mean something, but you know, English names don't mean something. But they, I, I would say they do mean stuff, and they mean things in a, in a way that tells you about social class, or it tells you about um, the background of this character. Or <coughs> There's a lot of information in a name that sometimes we, like my name, Anna, you might think, oh, it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't give anyone any association, but um, you know, my family's Scandinavian, or the, you can bring in lots of things about what, what a name um, evokes for a reader. And so I tried, when I was sort of sat down to do this, and I thought, am I going to do opinion, or am I going to translate? And I came up with this kind of like <laughs> half and half. Um, it seems a bit odd, maybe, but some of the characters um, some of the characters, it just didn't feel like there was a very good translation that really captured, that I could find that captured um, the character's name, or they were a real historical figure, like Cho Chu Ji. I felt like if I translated his name, uh, in other people would, I mean, people would know him from as, as a historical figure by his pinyin name, so I kept that. And Guo Jing, I played with the idea, would he be serenity or something like this, and I just thought, it's a bit too laden for the main character. It didn't quite work. Um, but then there were other characters. Obviously, in the extract that we heard, we have um, Yang Tie Xin, and Ironheart is a perfect kind of equivalent. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, so that um, felt good. Um, that felt like an easy one. But I basically, a case-by-case -case basis, had to really grapple with whether a translation would work and whether it would evoke something um, in English. And sadly, there were some where it just didn't feel like I could, I was reaching and I was reaching and I couldn't find something that, that really worked as a translation. So then they became pinyin. So it's a, it's a mishmash, but I feel like in a way, um, translation is never just one method. And sometimes people say, oh, that's kind of inconsistent. But actually, I just, as long as the character has the same name all the way through, um, that basic level of consistency, apart from that translation, is never consistent in the sense that you never get like one word will always be translated. It's all down to context and feel and how you, maybe that day, how you as a translator um, feel about a certain um, passage or something. And then that colors the way that you, they end up coming out. Um, 
Yeah, so that was a really difficult, you basically hit on the really, the most tough part about this, uh, yeah, translating this. But I think that it's good that, um, I'm, I hope that by having some of the character names being a bit different, people, English language readers who don't know any Chinese will find it a bit easier to remember the characters' names and uh, develop a relationship to some of the characters through that. <coughs> oh, hi. Um, I was wondering, as a female translator of a classically kind of male-dominated male book, as it were, um, topic, were you conscious of the fact when you were translating it? Or, I mean, did you try? Do you think you bring nuance to it in a way that just the other male <coughs> translators don't, or were you aware of it? Um, particularly given that, let's be let's hope not, but the readers of the translation would probably be mostly male. Are you aware of that? So I think, um, thank you for your question, it's a very interesting one, because I, I think well, before I started, I didn't really give much thought to it. I just kind of was, um, sort of got going, and I was you know, happily translating away. And then I did start to realize through the process, um, and since it's come out potentially more actually than during the actual translation process, that <clears throat> um, that obviously this is quite a male, as you say, it's quite a traditionally male-dominated genre, the readers and the fan discussions and things like that. But I think that um, it's been fun to be to to do this, be a be a female translator doing this um, book because I think actually the reality is there's lots of female readers of martial arts fiction, um, there's lots of female readers of fantasy and lots of female gamers and all this stuff. And I think that <coughs> sometimes um, it's like um, we get a bit lost. Um, and it's nice to be able to think that actually we are reading this stuff, we are translating it, we are helping to make it, we are consuming it. Um, in my own little small way, I hope that it's just, it's like a little signal or visibility to, to that because I think it's quite difficult for me to say whether or not it influenced my translation because obviously I'm not quite, I'm not really able to sort of fully step outside of myself and sort of say what would, would I have done anything differently. Um, but I think it's sort of, since it came out more that I'm, I'm aware of it and thinking about it a bit more than, than in the, well, I think I was just like this. <laughs> Whilst I was actually translating, I was kind of in my world doing it with my computer and uh, nobody noticed me, no one knew I was doing it. So I was just sort of um, happily beavering away, but yeah. I think Sue was saying earlier about how there are so many strong female characters in the book as well, and um, that was that really yeah, interesting to translate. Yeah, and um, like there were being able to sort of see certain moments in, for example, even characters that might seem on the face of it like they represent quite traditional sort of female roles, like um, in the book Charity Bow, she's she's you know the good wife. Um, she is described as being very caring and loving and very soft-hearted. And initially, you might think, oh, that's kind of quite a sort of, I don't know, stereotype. that's quite a sort of fe you know, traditional female description. But then there's this moment where she, um, she spots this man who's injured um, out to the back of her house. Um, and there's a moment, I won't spoil anything, but there's a moment that she shares with this man who she understands is not, uh, is the enemy, on the enemy side. And you start to, you see through that, there is a sort of hint of something more complex. There is a, a kind of ambigu moral ambiguity and there is this sexual tension and things. And I thought, um, that's something I really like about Jin Yong's writing, that he, even in those kind of, he picks these little moments um, to give you a bit more complexity and depth to the female characters. We have a question over here. I've got a question for Anna. Um, 20 years ago when I, um, like, you know, you, you were saying that it, well, 1980s is when first Chin mainland Chinese people read the Jing Yong's book. And it's quite clear dividing that boys read the Jing Yong and the girls read the Chong Yao, um, <laughs> the love story, which, you know, a lot of people, mainland China probably know. And then, you know, the girls who can or allow to read the Jing Yong feel very special because we are in the boys' trust of circle, you know. So it's, it's, it, so, um, then, but then once you start to read it, it's just so, 
you know, deep, there's a lot of meaning to it, and you will soon ditch Chung Ya and stick with Jung Yo. <laughs> um, so when I came to, to, to London, and when I met my husband, and you know, it's kind of like, I tried to introduce Chinese culture to him, and introduce, and of course, and I go, oh, what's the best way? Maybe I can try to translate the book. But then I soon find that, like, there's just so many contexts to it. For example, you know, when, when the Kung Fu, the Han Long Yo Hui, because it's all li linking with Yi Jing, so how do I explain <coughs> all of that, you know? So by the end, and then you find that you can type in for five hours, and it take five minutes reading, and then you go, what's the next one? And you go, no, go away, you know? You know? So I would try to ask you, when you're facing that problem, how do you choose which part you're just not going to explain? Because it's like, it's like, you know, when we go to National Gallery see a painting, if it's a Bible story, a lot of us, unless I read the Bible, I wouldn't know what it's about. But if it's a Western people, you don't need explanation. So how do you choose which part? You're not going to go detail. You just, you know, carry on with the story. So yeah, this is, I think this is a really uh, interesting question. Thank you. Because um, I think that from my point of view, um, obviously, uh, a Western reader who doesn't, doesn't, hasn't particularly studied Chinese history and a Chinese reader, they're coming at it from kind of two different sides. But um, I like to kind of make an analogy, um, not to denigrate the uh, Western readers, but I like to make the analogy of like a child who sits down with their parent to watch a really good um, sort of piece of children's, like a TV or something. And the uh, you know, the child is sitting there, <laughs> you know, it's really funny. And the parents sitting, <laughs> that's really funny. Because the thing that they're watching, the things, the jokes and the depth of the meaning that they're getting is, you know, they're, they're seeing all these references that the child doesn't really understand. But they're both sitting side by side and enjoying the same TV program. So for me, I feel like the layers, um, as long as like the, the, the first layer, you know, a reader enjoys it, it's, it, it's a good piece of fiction, they can get into the story. These kind of added depths that you can find in the story, I think, are it's part of a reader's journey. Whether they um, they read one junior novel and they, they start to read about Chinese history, they start to explore themselves. I think that readers are, you know, we should um, treat them with a kind of like a I guess like a re respect that they can go and fill fill in the detail themselves. They don't need to be told everything. Um, it's part of their journey and uh, an ex experience of a good novel is to inspire m curiosity and um, by potentially going away and reading more about Chinese history or learning a bit about the I Ching or something that they could come back to the novel, same novel, and see new things and read new things in it. I think it's not, um, I can't possibly give the depth of, of Chinese culture to, um, to a reader, um, uh, but they can read lots of, there's so many other books they can read to get that and then come back to Gion and reread re it. I think that's the kind of, that's the way that I see um, the best solution to this problem, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is to excite, it should be exciting and fun and then that is the catalyst that will make somebody, I think, um, be more curious and want to read more. Um, if you get sort of overwhelmed too much, okay, I'm going to do loads of footnotes, and I'm going to tell you everything there is to know about the, all the layers that you're missing, I want you to know everything you're missing, then those, that reader will be put off. They'll feel like, it's too much, you know, uh, I can't cope with this. I think the reader needs to be left to kind of uh, experience the story on their level, and even if they don't understand all of the depths, they are still had a genuine experience, and they still have that that knowledge and that experience that they've had is still just as kind of worthy as, as a Chinese reader who can get all the other bits to it as well. So you don't need to be an expert on Chinese culture to enjoy Jin Yong. I think you said before that the stories and the characters and the themes they're all universal ones. Yeah, it, yeah, and I think it's very important that that we don't sort of treat in in this. Um, Translating, obviously, Qin Yong is such a huge, major, important writer in China, in China but I think that uh, we've got to get to the real core of why Qin Yong is popular, and that is that he writes great stories. And this um, idea that one has to kind of like give all of the background, otherwise the reader won't get it or won't enjoy it. Um, it's kind of talking down a little bit to the reader as well, the, the English reader. They, they can 
go and read uh, and explore themselves more if they want more background. I think that's part of, I think it's good for readers not to have everything explained to them. That's what a good, a good novelist wouldn't explain everything either. They, uh, they, cr they give you the space for your imagination and your curiosity to fill in the gaps. I think that's a wonderful note to end this evening on. I'm sure we could carry on. But thank you very much to Anna and to Xiaoning and to Sue for joining us this evening um, to talk about this a wonderful new translation. And thank you to everyone for coming to our China in Context Festival. Um, we have plenty more events on tomorrow, so do join us again. And the book fair will be open until 8 o'clock if you'd like to go and buy yourself a copy of the new translation. Thank you so much. <laughs>